Tony Loach, I don't know if you remember. Tony Loach, yeah, Tony Loach. Loachy, Loachy said something to me that year, and I was, I, I'll, I'll never forget. And he told me after a game, he goes, Pat, how come you don't play with the same passion as you used to? Oh, wow. You used to be unbelievable to watch. I was like, and, you know, so it just showed that I didn't have that same, you know, it was that year was different. So if, if I knew it and that my opponent sees that and says that to me, I mean, it was, it was, and it was true. So I, I feel bad because I, I wish I, I would have done more, more for you to get you that 52. I'm sure if I would have been the player I was the, the year before then, I would have got you 50, maybe 60 for sure. That was Patrice Lefebvre, and you are listening to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolin. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolin, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolin, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Welcome back to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padolin for episode number 85. Today we have Patrice Lefebvre on the podcast. Uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be your host, uh, and you're in for a good one here with Patrice. Uh, Patrice isn't necessarily a household name, uh, not because of his uh, resume, that's for sure, but just because of when he played in the 90s and because he only ended up playing three games in the NHL. But those three games were super cool that he got them. Patrice happens to be five foot five. Um, very uncelebrated five foot five, and by uncelebrated I mean that when he played those three games, he, he's not acknowledged kind of in the chronicles of being one of the smaller players to ever play in the NHL as a position player. Uh, he he had door slammed in his face his entire life. We talk about that a lot on this uh, on this in this during this conversation. Uh, had a hard time uh, moving moving up the ranks, right? Even to get a, a shot at a junior team, a QMJHL team. Uh, was something that wasn't an automatic, despite his production at the minor hockey league level. Uh, he did get his chance um, in Schwinnigan, and not only did he get his chance, but he made the most of it, scoring 200 points in a season there, his last season there, leading the QMJHL in scoring, second in the league in scoring in his third year. Uh, Patrice was productive everywhere he went. He won a scoring title in the IHL level as a pro uh, multiple time 100 point seasons won the MVP of the IHL like the the accolades this guy has just go on and on and on um, played played during the 90s uh, played till he was 42 years old uh, played with a chip on his shoulder because he had to he played in the big man era and he knew how to get it done and he wasn't going to be pushed around he wasn't going to be stopped uh, doing what it is that he loved to do which was play the game and and to uh, most most importantly for him was setting people up he loved to be a playmaker I happened to be his line mate for for eight games uh, way back. Geez, I don't remember what year it was, but it was my second trade when I got traded from the the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs to the LA Kings on deadline day. Uh, I was moved in a deal for Yannick Perot, and uh, I was moved there. And I tell the story in, in this episode coming up, uh, kind of a funny travel story there. But I, when I first arrived uh, on the scene, I was sent to Long Beach to play with the Ice Dogs of the IHL, and Patrice was there. Uh, I got put in with Patrice for eight games. I needed or I didn't need I wanted a 50 goal season on the pro level I, when I got traded at the time of, of the trade I was leading the AHL in goals I had 42 goals at the time of the trade and when they uh, moved me across leagues obviously the the scoring race or titles don't count so I kind of started from zero in the IHL but in my head I needed eight goals uh, to get 50 uh, in a pro season so I ended up getting five there with Patrice as my centerman, I ended with 47 on the year, and uh, it was a pleasure to play with him for those eight games. Uh, I get into it uh, a little bit there, like the, the, the time we spent together, and Patrice talks about what type of player he was at that point in his career. But uh, a quick story, which I think might be interesting, is just how business-like uh, the game is, and even at the, at the level of the minor league level, where at the time... Uh, results let's say uh, people weren't really worried about rewarding you they were just worried about where they could get you uh, for instance when I when I did get traded there it was at the end of my entry level contract so I had 
I think it was a three-year contract or a four-year contract, your entry-level contract, and my contract had in a del- uh, deletion clause, meaning that if I played 40 games in the NHL in uh, during my, my first contract, if I played 40 games combined, it would be changed to a one-way. My contract would then be changed to a one-way, meaning uh, if I got sent down to the minors, they'd have to pay me NHL money. And that would also... Uh, roll into my next contract. So uh, to qualify me as an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year, if I made the 40 games, they would have to qualify me on a one-way contract. They couldn't give me a two-way. So what the LA Kings did, and I didn't even really understand this at the time. I was 22 years old and I was just playing hockey and I didn't really understand what was going on or ask too many questions. But when they sent me to Long Beach, it was with the sole intention I found out afterwards of keeping me down in Long Beach until LA, the Kings, had only enough games left in the season that I would end up at 39 games played uh, during my first uh, entry-level contract. So they made sure I didn't get my one way. They kept me at 39 games. And then so not only did they do that, but then when I came to camp the next year, I actually came to camp without a contract because uh, because what they what they offered me, and this is the way that the, the player bargaining agreement was at the time, but all they had to do to qualify me was to give me a 10% raise on my NHL salary from the year before. And then I essentially had no rights. Uh, that means that they, they kept ownership of me. And if I wanted to play, I had to play for them. But what, where players weren't protected back in that day and age was on the minor league side. So they actually qualified me uh, with a 10% raise if I played in the NHL, but they actually cut my minor league salary in half from my entry-level deal. Even though I just finished leading the AHL in goals and had a super productive year at the, at the minor league level, uh, they did not want to reward me for that. They did not want to acknowledge that. They actually wanted me to sign a, a contract that would give me a 50% pay cut after having an almost 50-goal season. So that was tough for me to swallow. We were trying to just, I wasn't, I wasn't negotiating at all about my up salary. I mean, I wanted, if I made the team, I would be more than happy. It was just more or less my state of mind and uh, my emotional well-being of if I did get sent down that I wouldn't be playing for, for half the money that I was the year before. Uh, so I came to camp without a contract. Uh, I came to camp in shape. Like they wanted me to 215 pounds. They said there was a spot for me on the right wing and, uh, and, and, you know, that I need to battle for a spot. And, and so I came to camp uninsured. You know, a lot of people said I shouldn't have, but I wanted to show that in good faith that I was ready to play for this team and I was ready to go. Uh, but I wasn't allowed to play in any exhibition games. And then they kept saying, I mean, you can make this team, but you got to get in exhibition games. We have to see you. So anyways, I ended up signing the contract. Uh, I ended up signing uh, with the 50% pay cut in the minors. They wouldn't move on that. And uh, lo and behold, they sent me to the minors. Uh, Andy Murray ended up selecting Brad Chartrand, um, who was a National League guy of his uh, from the year f- from years before. And, um, you know, I think he might have had 20 or 18 goals like the, the, the previous season when I had 47. And uh, anyways, and Brad's a good guy. I know Brad. Brad, if you're listening, no, no disrespect to, to you at all. But uh, it was it was one of those scenarios where I did get let go and uh, and I had to play for 50 percent less money. And um, and now it's more a little more meritocracy based and the minor league guys are protected a little more. But that's one of those scenarios now, like if I was running a business, like to save 70 grand or 50 grand on a minor leaguer, uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should, in my opinion. I think it should be meritocracy based. I think players should be rewarded uh, for their efforts and I think that they should be acknowledged as such. And, and you're going to get, I mean, you're going to build a better culture. You're going to, you're going to grow a better culture. And at the time in LA, uh, I think there'd be other people there that would agree with me that the culture was a little bit broken there for sure. So anyways, a long-winded story on what you have to put up with as a pro hockey player, uh, trying to make it and trying to get your foot in the door. It definitely doesn't go your way all the time, which is one of the reasons why we have this podcast and talking about mindset and all the things that are important to me. Um, but without uh, further ado, I want to get back to uh, uh, the, the guest of honor here, which is Patrice Lefebvre. Uh, again, a, a great, a great career. Lots of lessons learned. You're going to enjoy this, uh, this podcast a lot. It was uh, recorded while he was in Italy. I'm not sure exactly what part of Italy, uh, but a long way away. And there was a little bit of a lag, it seemed like. I don't think it's too bad. I listened to most of the recording. I, I think it sounds pretty good. But just if you are noticing, like, maybe a couple awkward pauses or, or things of that nature, that's just because our inter- internet connection wasn't uh, the best. So without further ado, I bring you uh, today's guest, Patrice Lefebvre. All right, we are live with my former centerman for a hot minute, right, uh, Patty, back in back in Long Beach. <laughs> but we have on the podcast, Mr. Yeah. Patrice Lafebvre. Welcome to Up My Hockey, sir. Thanks, Boyle. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. 
Hey man, my pleasure. I love when uh, I love when guys reach out because you know sometimes I mean like DJ Smith for instance, right? Like so DJ is a guy I played with in uh, Toronto with the Baby Leafs. Uh, got his number and he claims he wants to be on the podcast, but like chase him around, <laughs> chase him around, you know, and like never shows up. He's still, I'm still gonna get him on. But then it's awesome when I got guys that I used to play with, like yourself, that'll say, "Hey, if you need a guest? I'd love to have you." And it's like, my gosh, that'd be so perfect. So thank you for making it easy. Thanks for being willing, and yeah. uh, look forward to chatting with you. Absolutely, it's my pleasure again. Um, yeah. So I guess maybe we maybe we'll just start there, then we'll go back and and talk about your your uh, you know your own journey because it's a uh, it's a pretty cool one, uh, even from when I knew. But like where we cross paths because. Uh, I was with Toronto, as I said, and then I ended up getting traded for who the heck was it now? Yannick Perot. So Yannick Perot at the deadline um, from Toronto. And when I went over to actually, that's a funny story. You probably don't even remember this story, man. We're going to start this whole episode off with a doozy. <laughs> so I was in St. John's for about three years, right? Two and a mm -hmm. half seasons. And so I get traded at the deadline. When my agent calls, they're like, oh, yeah, the, uh, the Kings don't play. At this time, they thought I was going to go to Los Angeles, right? The Kings don't play yeah. for three days. You know, you're going to be on a flight tomorrow morning, uh, 8 a.m., whatever. You know, to your, here's your hotel. So, obviously, the boys take me out in St. John's, right? So, the boys take me out. Like, I'm in St. John's, it doesn't close there, right? So, like, we're essentially out all night. Pack up, get on the plane. You can't fly any farther either, like in North America, from St. John's, right, to, to Long Beach. All the way down. Yeah, so then I find out that we're going to Long Beach. So I'm like, okay, so we're going to Long Beach. That's where I'm starting. Get into the get into the uh, dressing room with my gear and, you know, eating peanuts on the plane and having slept. And, <laughs> and uh, Boxy's there, right? So Boxy's waiting yeah. there, and he's like, so you ready to go tonight? And I see my jersey's in the stall, <laughs> right? So I'm like, ready to go? Like, so in my head, I'm like going, holy shit. Like, no, I'm not ready to go <laughs> at all. Uh, yeah. But then I looked at him like, yeah, I'm ready, you know? So. Yeah. What do, you, what do you say, right? So I go back to the yeah. hotel, try and grab a quick nap and, and some type of a uh, food and, and get back. But so here's the funniest part. So I go back, Patty, to the rink. And I, so I was in there for like whatever, three seconds, right? The first time, you know, that big rink in Long, Long Island, yeah. I mean, in Long Beach. And so guys are warming up when I get to the, when I get to the rink. And I don't know, I've never been to the IHL. Right. I don't know. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know anyone on, on our team or the other team. So I started yeah. shaking hands and I'm introducing myself. Right. Guys are on the bike outside. I'm walking in the room. I've like introduced myself to six guys. I'm in the room and the guy says, hey, kid, I think you're on the wrong team. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I legitimately went in the wrong dressing room, started talking to all the boys. Oh, my hey, God. Guys. Hey what guys, donkey, eh? So I mean, yeah, I, you probably don't remember that, but I like <laughs> tail between my legs, like it'll go over funny. to the ice dogs, introduce myself to all you guys. Uh, yeah, so that was that was the uh, my introduction to the IHL. My goodness, what a mess! That's pretty smart. So guys, that had a long long flight, long night, doesn't want to get hit. Just go introduce yourself to the other guy's team. So hey, that guy's pretty nice. Yeah, we'll take care of him. <laughs> we'll leave him alone. <laughs> That's good. Oh my god! And then of course, like everyone, like everyone from LA was there too, like Dave Taylor and like their assistant coaches, you know, to yeah. watch that game. So, anyways, I don't think I stunk it up too bad, but my goodness, like you never know in pro hockey what you're gonna get, right? It's like oh god, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's funny though. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that was fun actually. Uh, well, we'll get back to Long Beach, I guess, because. Um, you know, you, you, that was the year that you actually played games in the NHL. So we'll, 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 but yeah, we'll, right before coming. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go back and, and talk about that. But so you grew up, you grew up in, in what, what part of Quebec did you grow up in? In Montreal. It's called uh, Point St. Charles. It's, uh, uh, Mark Bergevin is a, it's a neighborhood friend. Uh, we grew up together and, uh, and grew up in the neighborhood with, uh, with, uh, it's kind of a, the grungy neighborhood of Montreal in those days in the seventies. Uh, so yeah, it was a tough neighborhood to grow up with, but it was actually good for, uh, like you talk about making your yourself uh, a man, like we can say in, in those days, and you know taking uh, some confidence in yourself and going through a lot of uh, different things with uh, poverty and and violence and just like that. So was a big uh, big thing in my life when I grew up, especially with uh, the seventies with the Parti Quebecois and we had the train crossing with the other part with the English 
speaking people on the other side of the cross was crossing with the French guys was always meetings in schools and stuff like that and uh, it was a bit of a rough uh, neighborhood to grow up in wow so it sounds like it's way rougher than you're letting on too like uh, well, what, what... you know but uh, when you when you when you live in it it's something you don't really realize but after that when you go out from it then you go okay but you know in a way it kind of uh, kind of helped me get through uh, like you said for the next things next chapters of my life to get through with that well, yeah, going into a corner probably uh, for a hockey puck seemed a little easy after 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 the start. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> we can talk about that, especially at five foot five. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's true. It, it actually, it's, no, it's true. It actually, you know, when when you have to go through things, you know, and you know, there's many stories about my own friends, and that we can talk about later. But yeah, it's that neighborhood actually you know made the kind of the person who i am or the player i i became as well with not being scared of anyone or anything and you know making it through anyway so yeah that actually that kind of that helped me a lot too right well yeah i mean i didn't we haven't even gone to your height yet i mean i because i didn't really want even well we're, i wanted to talk <laughs> about it because it's relevant you know what i mean but i'm sure that's the first thing that yeah. people want to talk about or i mean is 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 obviously um <laughs> noticeable you mean right off the bat yeah. you mean you, it says five six in hockey DB, but you just said five five. So you're, you're yeah, is that what you five, are five five? Five five, yeah. Yeah, five five. Probably sure now. The older you get, the sh you sh you're supposed to shrink. So <laughs> maybe I'm five four now. <laughs> right. But yeah, man. But so five five. You're born in '67, so you got nine yeah. years on me. Um, I guess the '90s was really when the game was the biggest. You know, like kind of like yeah. that that era when you were yeah. in Las Vegas. There, going through that, you know the league was huge. Everyone was big, right? Yeah. They wanted big yeah. guys and everyone was, was large. Like being, being five, five, how, like, well, first of all, you had to have a different mindset for sure. Right. How you said, like you, you had yeah. to, you had to have a belief that it didn't matter. You know, did, did, yeah. is that what you carried with you? I assume. Oh yeah. All the time. Yeah. You know, I believe in myself. I mean, I was raised by my grandmother and my grandmother always, you know, she, cause she knew what was going on. And my, my dream since I was, Three four years old when I first started playing skate was to make a, be a hockey player playing the NHL and but you know going up you you see the differences after a while but I was I always strive to be the best and, and to prove everyone that I could I could play because in seventies well eighties especially my junior years there was there was no room for me so nineties man I became a pro so yeah it was always had that have that that confidence a bit of that cockiness if it's if I can say but. I, I needed that to 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 make sure that I could play and and show that I could play. So that absolutely that mindset followed me my, through my whole career. Yeah, it's, I, I've actually talked about that a little bit with well, sometimes with my clients, but even on on my platform and like that difference. You said the word cocky, and it's I think there's like a subtle difference between cocky, confident, and swagger. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean, like. Yeah, and maybe you were cocky. I don't know, but like I, I definitely know, and I see it with guys. Like when the comp, like when you just kind of know, you know, like you can just see that yeah. they know, and and it's not, yeah. it's not I'm better than you, or it's not like you're worse, uh -huh. but it's just like it's a belief, right? And I, and that's what yeah. I call like the swagger. I mean, I, I like yeah. I like when I see kids with swagger. It's a belief that I can do it. I it's it was not about that. I'll show you. It shows that I can do it, and I will show. Like I will show. It. I know in myself that I can do it. So that was. More, you know, you can't get in at five foot five in the corner and, and shoulders down, and and you know that's it's not gonna work. And especially what you said in the eighties and nineties was about big guys and intimidation was a big, big part of the hockey game. And so I, I I made sure that I was not intimidated, and and I showed that. So I had no choice to do that too. So it was kind of a a barrier I had to put, you know, in front of me. I love that. And there wasn't like, was, was there an example for you uh, growing up like that you, that you saw? Like I, I one of the, th the people I talk about is, um, oh my gosh, now I'm drawing a blank in his name, but that uh, five foot four guy that played in Columbus. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, Ernie. What? Who? Is that er Ernie? Oh, Nathan Is Gerby. Him? Nathan Gerby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nathan Gerby. Gerby I can't believe Gerby. I have a blank yeah. on him. Five foot four, and he had a great article in the Players Tribune. I don't know if you read it, but like about, and it was essentially about belief, right? Like it, it was about, 
everyone in the world essentially told him that he would never make it because he was too small. Right. And so but one of his belief systems was that my size will not dictate my future. Right. That's going to have nothing to do with it. So he believed something that nobody else believed. And because he believed that he put in the work required for it to get done, you know, and he Mm -hmm. showed up on the ice in a way that allowed him to get it done. Um, And that's where like mindset is like so massively critical. But like for these younger guys coming up now, like they get to they got to see a Nathan Gerby in there. I mean, there's not many five foot four hockey players, but. For the guys that are smaller, like, wow, is that inspiring to see him standing beside Zdeno Chara, right? Like, holy smokes. Did you have oh, yeah. somebody that, that you were looking at um, growing up? Like, Fleury was a smaller player. I don't know if you liked him or not. but Yeah, but, you know, like you said, I agree what you say, but you still have to have, you know, was it different times when the, the rules, there were no rules anymore when the younger, smaller guys finally could make it. But, I mean, for me, my, my idol was Ivan Kournoye, who was a captain of Montreal Canadian. I wore number 12 my whole life uh, until junior major because of him and because he was smaller and, you know, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's funny when you say that because you still have somebody to give you a chance. So you can do all the work. You can do everything on the ice. You can have that extra work, extra motivation. But if that person doesn't give you a chance, it's not going to happen. So fortunately, fortunately, hockey's changed in the, in the 2000s, 2005 and six, it started with the taking the rules off and stuff like that. And finally, and you know, it's open space. But even though um, in the days, the 90s, I mean, I know it's going to sound pretentious, but I've played against all the big guys that had great careers in the NHL and I still dominated. So, you know, so it was a bit of a uh, unwritten rule of, uh, if we can say, it's, it's a strong word to say racism, but, uh, you know, short guys could not play. And there's no... There's nothing in the rule book of the NHL that says there's a height limit. So, you know, it was, uh, it was yeah, it's, so it's, it could, I could have had a 15, 20 year career in the NHL. Who knows if I would have had that chance besides the height, because the year that Vinny Danfoos, and I'm not saying I'm better than Vinny Danfoos by no means, but, you know, I was playing with him and we were always, me and him all the time. And Vinny's six, what, six, two, six, three, and five, five. And, but the numbers were still there, so I mean, it's it's great that hockey's changed. Honestly, I'm I'm so glad that it changed to give the opportunities for younger, got shorter guys to make it. Yeah. It's calling hockey is a game of talent, a game of speed, and it's it's always has been, and, and it's it's great now that it's like that. But yeah, it's you need somebody who's gonna give you that chance, you know. So yeah, where'd you play with Vinny? Absolutely, I played against Vinny all the time, and then we played the uh, All Star teams uh, together on the same team when it started to have that Quebec and Ontario uh, All Star teams playing once against the other. Oh, is that like uh, the but Q- we always the we Q- were Q- always rivals. In, in yeah, junior, Quebec league? junior league against Ontario Hockey League. Yeah, uh, yeah. we had that uh, that start that first first season of uh, trying to see all you know the teams the leagues playing against the other leagues in the All Star. Right. So yeah, but Vinny and I were always. Uh, uh, playing against each other, it was always uh, close with points. Who's going to be one? Who's going to be two? And stuff like that. So yeah, but he's a good guy. I mean, he's a friend of mine and he's a good person. Yeah. What? Uh, so how did you get your chance with Schoenigan? Like you, you talked about opportunity. I mean, even to play in you know, major junior hockey uh, what was was a massive yeah. accomplishment. I'm sure that a lot of people, you know, wouldn't have given you that that chance or that opportunity. So how did that ever happen? So a funny story. I played that two, two years major triple A. I'm uh, I, we were two guys making it the first year major triple A, and uh, then the second year, and we changed uh, everybody changed GMs, coaches, and stuff like that. And our GM, uh, his name is Raymond Demers, so I owe him a lot. This, uh, God rest his soul, bless his soul. He's uh, he's left us, but he's uh, he's our GM and he's uh, the head scout of the Shawinigan Cataracts. So he's, you know, he comes in and he's during the season. He starts talking to me and this and that. He goes, uh, what, "Where would you like to be drafted? What round?" I said, "Well, obviously, every player's go first three. Obviously, you know, first round, I'd love to be, you know, I'm second league and score in the league. I think I can play." But I said, first three rounds would be would be great." Yeah, he goes, "No, no, you're not gonna be drafted in the first three rounds. You're gonna be drafted in the fourth round." And I was like, and then he laughed, and I was like. That's weird. No, I'm not. I'm going to be trapped in the first three rounds. You know, a cocky little guy who said you want to, you know, obviously. So so finally we meet uh, the coach from the cataracts at a, we had a dinner with uh, me and my best friend. 
we go and we meet him and the GM and run the point. Unfortunately, he left us too. And we have a, a, a dinner and he and run the point. He's like, hey, yeah, uh, did that. We won't tell you where you're going to be drafted. That's what his first says. I said, well, he said fourth round. <laughs> and he just said it like that. So I'm like, okay. So draft day comes, first round, second round, third round, nothing. Fourth round, second draft, showing against Alex, Patrice Lafayette. I'm like, what the hell just happened? So when I went to the table, him and Ron Lapointe were laughing. And he goes, I have to tell you, every team in the league pretty much called us. And we said, no, you're not going to play that. You were too scared to play junior. You're going to play in the States. So nobody's taking you. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that was a big story. So, but yeah, Ramon Damaris and Ron Lapointe, they they. They believed in me, they saw me, and Ron Lapointe came from uh, Verdun as well, which is a neighborhood right beside, tough neighborhood there too, and I think he you know, he knew from where I came from, and he saw me play, and he just, he's the one that, I, I owe my, my career to Ron Lapointe, absolutely. And more the mess as well for, for choosing me and taking me, but Ron Lapointe, he's a, he's a man that really, he's probably the one, the most be biggest believer of, my, of me, 100%. Did you have him the whole time in Schwinnigan? No, unfortunately, I had like one year and we lost in the Memorial Cup finals. And then he went to Washington to be a assistant coach with uh, Brian Murray and stuff. Yeah. And he's the one that first got me my first uh, camp, pro camp with Washington uh, as an invited, invited player. So in 1986. And, uh, you know, so it's, he's, he's believed in me all the time. He got me my contract with Vancouver after that. And, I mean, a lot of things happen because of him. So, I mean, I, I owe, I owe him my, pretty much my career as well to him, 100%. Well, like you said, though, I mean, the thing is, yeah, you do need to have a believer. Um, you know, someone that's going to yeah. believe in you. But you had to have wanted him over for some, some way as well, you know. And that's the thing where, you know, I think that we discount that, you know, as far as how we show up, you know, how we, how we go about our business, <laughs> our professionalism, like what we're really prepared to do uh for for this dream called hockey right like it's sometimes it's yeah. easy and, and and i was one of those guys like i i for whatever reason like i wanted everything to be about what i did on the ice you know what i mean and if I, I worked my ass off off the ice but i never did it like in the locker room or i never came early to the rink like i was i was almost mm -hmm. like the opposite like okay. trying to i don't know like it was weird it was, my head was just different right like i like i said i worked hard but i wasn't really worried about what everyone thought Right. I, or, or how, or how yeah. I was perceived, you know, but God, that matters. Like that yeah. matters so much. Like, like you said, that one coach, that's why I talk to my guys about now. I'm like, you don't want to be inauthentic and you don't want to be a suck up and you don't want to be any of those things. No. But what you need is a fan. You need a fan, yeah. right? You need someone who likes you. Right. And you need, and, and what do coaches like? They like guys that care about their teammates. They like guys that work their yeah. asses off. They like guys that are committed to getting better. Right. You know what I mean? Like you check those yeah. boxes and you're going to have a fan. Like, I promise you, like it's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. you know, like, so you obviously impressed him, I guess, is all I'm saying. And then once you got your foot in the door, like, holy shit, man, like, obviously they knew what the hell was going on and everyone else was rattled. They never had yet. Like you led the league in points your last year, your second year, your third, your third year there. Um, yeah. Obviously a, an incredible career, 200 points in a season. Uh, yeah. That's pretty special. Uh, like, talk about your time in Schoen again. Yeah, again, like I said, my first year with, with Ron LaPointe, I, uh, Sergio Momesso was there, uh, Dave Casper was our captain. What a what a what an example! That guy was an unreal example. Like you, I was lucky enough to live with him in, uh, on the billets, and uh, that guy, he was a dirty player. Dirty player did everything for the team. Like, but he was what a leader. He, you know, he's, he's, he's the guy that helped me a lot, too, in my, my first year. Uh, what a year we had my first year. We started, like, 2 and two and 10 our first year, and we had curfews every night, and then Ron LaPointe came in and, and before a practice, and he said, you guys are not going to practice. Just there's some beers there in the middle. You guys have beers. You do whatever you want. You make sure nights before game there's curfew. I don't care. And then we started winning and we didn't, we let like 17, 15, 17 straight. We ended up winning the championship in that year. And then the first team winning the championship had the, the host of a Memorial Cup. So 
It was a fun year. We uh, went Mineral Cup finally to win again, but because of our old rings, the TV couldn't, was not right for television. So we moved to another team with Drummondville, another Dreams Rink, and we lost to the finals to Prince Albert, but I really believe that if we would have played in Chilwin again, I think we could have, well, who knows, but our chances would have been there for sure, playing our own rink in front of our fans and stuff. So, but great years, great years, uh, great year, race first year to start. And then I uh, played with a guy's name, Stefan Wood, won the Stanley Cup in Montreal in 93, sorry. Made some great friends, the guy like, Danny Paul, Robert Page. I mean, I meet I meet so many good good people there too that uh, helped me. You know, you don't do all that those points by yourself. So I was fortunate to play with some very good people as well. Did you play with? Uh, were you guys on the same line, you and LeBeau? We my second year, me it was uh, me, LeBeau, and uh, Dennis Paul. We were unbelievable. But the biggest thing with me and Stefan LeBeau is our power play. We played on the power play together. My sec, my third and fourth year, not really. We didn't play the same line, but our power play, like just example, last year, at my 200 point season, he scored 45 on the power play, and he scored like, he scored 90 goals, 92 goals or something. So our power play was just lethal. <laughs> That's fantastic. I know you love to pass the puck too. Like you love to pass the puck. Yeah. I mean, you still had 64 yeah. goals yourself uh, that last year. What Thank you very much for listening to the podcast today. We're going to take a short break just to remind you that there are ways that you can follow me. Uh, I know some of you listen uh, are very faithful listeners of the podcast. I thank you for that. Uh, I am, I have been posting the podcast now, the uh, the recorded version, the video version on YouTube. So if there are any YouTubers out there that are listening to the audio version of this, by all means, subscribe to my channel on YouTube. I am trying to uh, get more content on the YouTube channel and promote that uh, and grow that channel. I really have no idea how, other than um, just to produce content and uh, and to and to ask in a format like this. So please, uh, if you want to support me and support out my hockey, get on get on YouTube. You can also follow me on Instagram at Jason. Pad- Dolan. Uh, it's more of a kind of a personal feed there with definitely some hockey content. And there's also my Facebook group, which is the parent group called Up My Hockey. It's a private parent group on Facebook. Lots of good stuff in there. Lots of great support and lots of great people. You're first at Omaha Way programs in there. You're first to uh, get access to the master classes and, and uh, things of that nature. So all great ways to follow me. Uh, if you want to know about the programs, uh, when they're coming, how you can work on your mindset, how you can work with me directly, uh, how you can work with me on the ice um, in some skill development stuff, get to upmyhockey.com, U-P-M-Y, hockey.com, and look under the services tab. Uh, You'll see when all the peak potential guided missions start. Um, You can also see how to get your team involved in a peak potential project and work on on your team chemistry and team building and get you all on the same page when it comes to uh, resiliency and mental toughness and and striving and being able to uh, reach for your potential. So uh, those are all great ways to uh, to follow what I'm doing and be a part of the action. And uh, and if you want to step forward and actually work on the most important thing that will give you the biggest competitive advantage, and that's your mindset, uh, that's where to find me. Okay, now back to the conversation with Patrice Lafave. But you also had 142 PIMs. I mean uh, – what uh, were you? I mean, I, I you played edgy, but were you playing really edgy back in those days? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was the style in the eighties. You had to. I mean, I I had my seven, eight, ten fights a year, and you know, I had, I got some. I gave back, and you know, you know, vice versa. So you know, trying to try to people trying to intimidate me, but that you know, you want to give me one, I'll give you two, and you know, that's how it was. So I had right. to, I had to, and I hated, I hated the fact that. That's one of the thing, biggest thing, and I know it was the game those days. But I hated the fact that oh, we'll, we'll get Bodo to to protect you, and I hated that. I mean, I've always I always wanted to fight my own fights, and you know, I understand that the bigger guys, that the guys at the roles, had to do that between them. But I never, I never really, I always wanted to fight my own fights, even if I lose, I don't care. I only I show up, and then you know, people will will know that I'm not gonna back down. So. Right. Win or lose, so that's that's that was a big thing for me. So I had, always had that that short man syndrome on the ice most of the time with that. So absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, call it what you will. I mean, if you were six two, it wouldn't be called short man syndrome. It would just be called you were gritty, right? So, um, you know, yeah, I, exactly. 
Yeah, you definitely played that way. And, and, and you were smart enough to recognize that you had to, though, too, right? I mean, that's the other thing. Yeah. You, you yeah. Know, or else you're going to get taken advantage of and you're not going to stick around. So, I mean, that was, uh, yeah. that, was, that was good on you to do that. What, um, so what, what about the NHL draft? I mean, were you, did, did you ever talk to teams? Was there, did you, were you hoping? I mean, you obviously had some big seasons there. Yeah. Your draft year was what? The, was that your rookie year, your draft 85. year, your first draft year? Yeah. 85 was my, uh, my draft year. And uh, on the point told me during the Admiral Cup tournament that I opened some eyes because, uh, you know, I did a great, had a great um, M Cup tournament. I was uh, chosen on the R13 in the tournament and as a right winger. So, yeah, uh, Cole View was there. A guy named Damon was uh, first rounder, I think, from Boston. Cole, obviously, you know, the career he had in the NHL. And the little old and I was, you know, I made it to the, uh, the All Star team. So, around the point, said, you know, there there might be a chance. So, you always, you always hope for it. And then that happened. So, yeah. So I was fortunate again. Around the point, I uh, got me to talk with Brian Murray in 1986 in Montreal, the old forum after after the draft, and got the, that invitation there. So, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you were eligible for two years. I mean, your second year there, you had 136 points in 69 games. Yeah. You know yeah. that was pretty impressive too. But again, it just you weren't you. Well, I guess it was, the only thing is you weren't big enough, right? I mean, for, exactly. for, for that draft, that must have been it, right? Because you were yeah, always smart it. enough well, and you're good yeah. enough, but you didn't get the chance. That was always the excuse. You're too small. Too small. Right. So, yeah. so after a 200-point season in Shawinigan, um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you must be feeling pretty good about your 29 points in 11 games in the playoffs. Uh You end up going to, to Paris, the uh, Hockey DB says. Like, so what <laughs> – what, uh, like, where, where were you at? Like, what did you want to do? Was that your first choice? I, I assume you wanted to stay in no. North America, but you weren't given a chance. Yeah. Or what, what happened after that? So, so run the point. So, run the point again, calls me, goes, Hey, listen, I got you in the uh, in Canada. Dave King was the coach, Guy Chiron was the assistant coach. So, we went to Calgary at the camp in the beginning to make so that those days, Team Canada was a traveling team. We played 60, 70 games and Russia, whatever, all over the place. And, and uh, so I went. Uh, Chris Draper was there. Brad Schlegel, defenseman, was there anyways. <clears throat> so that tournament, and I finished first in scoring in that tournament. So that camp. So I played, uh, I think, two, one or two games a day or something like that. My memory is losing me here. But anyways, we're there for like eight, nine days. And. So we do that tournament and, you know, try and like make a camp to, to get to make the team. So finish first in scoring. And then last day, Guy Chiron comes to me and he goes, uh, yeah, uh, Dave thinks you're too small to play against the Russians. So we're not going to we're not going to keep you. So it's pretty late. Uh, it's August late. So I'm having some old the old IHL before the Las Vegas IHL I played with was the older one and they offered me like two teams offered me like like sixteen thousand in the US to play and go there, you know, and those that league was a bit of a of a tough league. Don't want to call it a good league, but that's the that's the word we used to use those days. And and then I have a my agent calls me, he goes, There's a team in, in France, Paris, they they wanna offer you a contract. So okay. He goes, Yeah, this is the amount and this and that. I said, so there were some Canadian guys there with passports. I was like, all right. So I went there, had my first experience in Europe, and ended up winning the championship after 54 years of existence that day there. So that was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a tough year in the beginning to get adjusted with everything. Yeah, I was a single guy there by myself, and everything was different. But, uh, you know, winning, winning made it easier at the end, and, then I met some some good people there, and then after that, I got uh, an offer to go play in Switzerland. From there, so you know everything swirled about. I went to play with Switzerland after that in the A in the A League at a at a worst team in the league, but personally I had a pretty good season with nobody to play with. And then who called me again after the season? Around the point, got me a contract to hear a deal in Vancouver. So, yeah, so everything started again from there.
But yeah, that Paris I uh, came out of nowhere just because of Team Canada. My goal was to play for Team Canada, hundred percent. Right. Oh, that must have been frustrating, hey? Because I was actually thinking, like, what a great, you know, what what a great foot in the door. I mean, you would think that that would be the exact type of hockey that would be awesome, right? International hockey, you know, that is yeah. isn't isn't quite as well. Again, not that you couldn't handle the physicality, but you would think like that that genre of hockey would be more apt to give you an opportunity, right? Yeah. But then, you know, if you figure that Mario Lemieux could not play for Team Canada because of defensive game, so I, <laughs> I'm not going to be too mad then. Did he get cut from Team Canada? <laughs> he didn't even get invited. I think, yeah, one time he's, yeah, yeah, no Mario Lemieux. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is what it is, I guess. But, yeah, that's frustrating. That's when you f- feel... You know that good for you for for keep going though, right? Like that's when some guys just pack it in, right? And they're like, "Oh, it's you know, I'm a victim. It's not working out for me. You know, poor me." And you yeah. go down that rabbit hole pretty easy, right? Because, mm-hmm. oh yeah, because yeah, because shit. You mean you were you were, you led the thing in points? I mean, what else are you supposed to do, right? You're obviously productive. Yeah. You could do this, and and it's easy to pack your bags and go home. But I mean, you kept going. Like I said, you won a championship and uh your, your supporter brings you back over and uh, where was so when is that the 9091 season then when you played for the ahl ihl and ech yeah. that, yeah, that was a that was a tough i mean i i was going through things too personally so probably my worst hockey came from 19 yeah 89 90 91 that was my worst hockey that i ever played because i was uh, was worse things outside of hockey that was going on so you know met this girl and fell in love and thought about just her instead of thinking about hockey and being uh, uh career driven like i was before so that kind of got out of my not my safety zone but my comfort zone in hockey and i was i was not myself when i played so uh, i was i was moving around trying to make happy everybody else you know what i mean so and uh, and it's on me it's my it's it's it, but it's learning experience but yeah that was that was a tough almost two years of uh of not playing myself like i was not myself at all i, I looked at me playing and even when i played in uh, milwaukee that year i was not even after player i was in camp and i wasn't camp in vancouver i had an unbelievable camp like i i ended up playing with uh igor larry and Auburn. Brian Adams there and that Lee on that line it was I was the only rookie guy that did that and I had I was had terrific exhibitions and and then my girlfriend came in and back to Milwaukee with me and I, I just know it just my head was not in hockey my head was somewhere else and it, and it showed and a, a five foot guy you need to be hundred percent all the time like I was and I was not there and you know I was not happy and I was trying to make the other person happy so so yeah, that was that was a bit. This, those two years probably were the worst two years of hockey that I had statistically, and 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 not being myself on the ice as well. So, right. So did you have? So that's why. Go ahead. No, that's why I moved around. I moved around. Uh, yeah, I got uh, that chance to go to Europe again, and uh, a guy named Ken Tyler, that was a McGill University coach, brought me and another guy named Giru there. And when we got there two days after, not three days after, he got fired. So the two guys that were there already, they were, you know, fan favorites and they were there for a long time. So when we got there, they kind of got pushed over. So we got on that, they changed the coach and we came to a practice. It was a German coach there from Switzerland. As soon as we came in the rink and he's, I, he's just looked at us and he says, you guys are not coming on the ice ever since I'm here. So I'm like, okay. So we got the contracts bought out. Went spent the holidays in Montreal and then uh, my agent said hey there's a team in, uh, in the East Coast League that uh, wants to bring you some like, uh, East Coast well what I gotta do I'm here I gotta play hockey so and I went to Louisville Kentucky and then uh, I actually had a good a good uh, a good run there good good hand of the scene like I say but yeah so that's how I got that one game in uh, in AHL but Jimmy Roberts, but the team was there, so Jimmy Roberts got me in, but he didn't didn't really play me anyway. So right. it was more of a favor, I think, that I got uh, called up there. But yeah. So you were all over the place. I mean, I know that. I, yeah. That's the one yeah. thing. Like when I'm talking to, you know, pro hockey's tough, 
I mean, yeah. regardless, and I don't care if it's the NHL, AHL, or East Coast League. I mean, it's there's there's a different level of uh, you know commitment and stuff that you have to deal with. Let alone like the the moving, you know, like that. Yeah. I've I've said that story a few times. Like my first year pro, so twenty years old, like first time really living on your own, right? Like apartments yeah. and bills and you know figuring out everything. I played on four teams, right? Like I was in the minors with Greensboro. I was up with Florida. Got traded to Toronto and then got sent down to St. John's. Like that's four different sets of coaches, four different sets of teammates, four different cities. Yeah. Twenty-one years old, trying to figure out how to be a pro on the ice, trying to figure out how to live. I mean, everything yeah. else. Like, and that's the stuff that you know we talked about a little bit before. Is like no one talks about that stuff. No, and people Ever. don't realize how hard it is. Yeah. Oh, you're just, oh, you're just playing hockey. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's not. That's not. That's not the hardest part. I mean, it, yeah, just playing hockey. Well, yeah, it's, a, it, it's it, yeah, it's a game. You get you the almost ice. four time zone, time frame zone, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the and the other thing is, is like if you were to talk to, I mean, whoever, you know, I mean, your local your local electrician, right, and and. And just tell them that, hey, uh, the phone could ring tomorrow and you're going to be playing hockey. Or you're going to be an electrician in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, yeah. right? Like, yeah. Yeah. like, because that's essentially what happened three times. Like, it's like, like that whole, that whole mindset scenario is, is tough. So, I mean, you're, you're yeah. bouncing around, you're trying to be a hockey player. You got your girlfriend on the mind, you know, you're not playing the way you want to be able to play. It's tough. It's tough. And yet, so you an NHL deal though, right? Is that accurate? Like Vancouver, yeah. it was an NHL contract. Yeah. Yeah, I had a two-year deal uh, in Vancouver, and then the farm team was uh, was in Milwaukee, and uh, yeah, I just got I just got bought out of my my, my remaining year and the, the rest of the year. Yeah. So, so when you got when you got into Vegas, then was that was that uh, an IHL deal? IHL, yeah, IHL deal, absolutely. So when did you get your next NHL deal? Uh, right before well, right before I met you, I uh, I. Uh, Got signed in uh, Washington in 1998. Yeah, December 1998. Gotcha. Yeah. So, like, so looking back on that, I mean, you've already been very candid and honest about it, but like that NHL, I mean, that NHL deal was a big opportunity. Hey, okay? like to, like, yeah, to have that. You know, I, it, it was, but it, it was. Don't get me wrong, it was. But the thing is that the year before, I had an unbelievable year. Like we, I think we had about 80 players in Vegas coming through. Like, I was playing with – I didn't know I was playing with one from one game to the other. And I, I led the league in scoring. I had the MVP of the league that year. And then what happened is during this, this summer, I had asked uh, the management, you know, because I had two more years in Vegas. I had some big, big, big offers in Switzerland. I said, hey, you know, it's – is it okay if I get out of my contract? And that created a uh, kind of a cold a bit, I guess, you know. So imagine was was not happy and there was some uh, some things said from management in the papers in the summer and that kind of broke pretty much the five years that I worked hard of playing, being in the, in the making a, a name for myself, being in the community, uh, representing uh, uh, big brothers, big sisters, uh, being involved with Make a Wish Foundation, that kind of broke everything, my my spirit and everything. So I started my sixth year in Vegas. We changed everything, and it was it was a tough start, to be honest with you. And then uh, I don't remember what game out, but I got my first injury of my life. Uh, I tore my MCL and I was out for about two and a half months. So when I came back, I was not in shape, playing with that big Dow Jones uh, uh, knee brace that they had in those old days. And I, I, I mean, my my head was not in it anymore. Like it was different. I didn't have that that drive that, you know, it was, it was weird. Then I, uh, our GM, which I owe him a lot, uh, uh, Bob Strom, he's, he's the one that gave me a chance in Vegas and I, I'm always going to be grateful to him. Uh, Washington came to practice in Vegas for a few days and we had uh, George McPhee come to practice and they needed some players and I got signed. So, yeah, it was a big opportunity. Again, timing was not good. I would have probably come that year before when I, everything was, when I was on my my game, you know, and I'm just saying if, 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 but probably would have been different uh, turnout. But 
yeah, so I went in and I uh, had uh, probably a seven, six, seven, eight minutes maybe of time and had the power play time my first game. And then after that, it was Fort Line and play your games. And then that's it, you know. So I had Ron Wilson uh, as a coach. So, yeah, that was it. That was it. That was those three games. But, you know, I still, I'm still grateful that I had those games to play in the NHL. But the time was, was, was not – I wish it was a different time. You know, yeah. you don't you don't decide that, unfortunately. Well, yeah, man. I mean, Vegas, like so, with Vegas, how did how did that ha- like how did Vegas happen? I, where where the heck is the yeah. Billingham Bombers? Like, wh- how did you end up there? And like that, you yeah. came from Billingham to Vegas. Exactly. So here's the story from the continuous from the girlfriend. So finally, because we were always together, and uh, she was coming with me everywhere, and then. Uh, uh, Short story, I get my, my first house built in, in the suburb of Montreal with her. And then, you know, during that last year, I went to Cloton and, and Sierra, what you see on the on the sheet there. And then she stayed back home to watch the works of the house. Then I come back and then two months later, not even one month living in the house, she, she, she breaks up with me on the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So talk about experience. So I was, you know, I was, my heart was broken, this and that. I'm like, oh, I'm going to stop playing hockey now. My life is over. You know, it is. And then my best friend, uh, now my best friend calls me a guy I knew from, from minor hockey and major triple A. He calls me and we have the same age. He goes, hey, come play with me in England. We're going to have some fun. We're, you know, going to dominate. We'll be together. And I said, ah, all right, I'll go. And it was probably the best move of my life. I uh, regained uh, the joy to play. I had fun with him. I met some great people. Uh, him and his wife are, are my best friends now. He's my, he was my uh, my best man at my wedding, and he's. We, I mean, I had so much fun there, playing hockey again. Just having fun playing hockey. That you know, I was my my old self again. So, and I was far away from my ex girlfriend, so I didn't have to be close. So it was easier to to forget, if I can say, you know. Yeah. So everything kind of chained together and then uh yeah and then i have my agent call me goes yeah vegas wants to sign you because uh bob strom knew of me because of uh ron lapointe that he met before and so it's kind of a circle you know so so ron bob strom gave me a chance and we never looked back that's uh that's so wild that you mentioned. Well, first of all, for everyone listening, and I, mean, I have the hockey DB open up in front of me. But so in the in the English league, there, uh, Patty had 165 points in 36 games, um, <laughs> which is absolutely bonkers. And I and I looked on the team. So it was your buddy, the Laplante or whatever, and he had yeah. he had like 166 or something. So you guys yeah. definitely did dominate and had a good time. So, you know what? Yeah. I had a similar experience. Like when I, I uh, it's funny how our how our uh, careers kind of crossed and I'm going to get to Bob Strom in a second, but I had a similar experience when I was done in Mannheim because I played Mannheim after you did. I was there and, uh, and I, I kind of lost, I, I got hurt. My shoulder was hurt. Um, it never really felt like the same player after I came back, you know, and, and had a different role. And I just, I felt like I was kind of hanging on, you know, mm-hmm. like I felt like I was sort of hanging on. I was 29 years old and I was like, you know what, I've, I, this has been a good run 10 years professional. I'm, I'm done. Right. Yeah. And uh, went back to school. Uh, I shouldn't say went back. Like for the first time, like went, went to university and thought that was going to be fun. And it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. But when I was at university and I thought that I was retired, all these, I mean, all these kind of interesting places kept calling, offering me jobs, right? And uh, and the one that was like su- super interesting to me was was this uh, team in the Japanese league. So. I ended up going there after Christmas. I, I wrote my finals for the first semester, or first term, whatever you call it. And then I hopped over there. It was like a two month gig. They, they're, they're only allowed one import. They weren't happy with their import. And, and so they brought me in. And uh, anyways, long story short, like I had I had fun playing again. You know, mm-hmm. like I I was yeah. scoring goals. I was the guy. I felt good about my game. You know what I mean? It was it, it was it was yeah. just like refreshing. And I was like, you know what? I want to. I want to give this another kick of the cat, you know, and that's when I ended up going back to Detroit. I got a trial with Detroit uh, with Ken Holland and, and Babcock were there. And anyways, I mean, I had a really good chance to make that team, to be perfectly honest. I ended up hurting myself in camp and it never worked out. And, you know, there's an opportunity to go play in the AHL again. But I was 
I didn't fall in love with it that much that I wanted to go ride the bus again at 30 years old. Right? I was like, no, I kind of wanted the NHL. But I totally re- recognize what you're saying there, right? You just go back. There's a different, uh, th- there's a different level of like intensity, right? Like it's still pro and it was fun, right? But it yeah. was, th- th- I don't know. I just, I just really was able to let loose and just have a good time, and and I kind of fell in love with the game again. But uh, but yeah, back exactly. to Bob, Bob Strum though, Patty. So Bob yeah. Strum was the GM of the Spokane Chiefs. Yeah. And he was the guy who listed me at 13 years old. Like he was the first guy that I got in contact with uh, with the Spokane Chiefs. And that was it was before the draft, right before the draft uh, came into existence for the WHL. You used to be able to put somebody on their player list. Yeah, so you had yeah, yeah. List. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So at 13, you were able to do that. So on my 13th birthday, Bob Strum made this deal uh with the moose jaw warriors because they were lower in the standings blah 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 and anyway so strummer like was like one of my biggest fans for like the first yeah. probably two years till he got let go and what a great guy he was i mean i i didn't know him yeah. super well as a person but boy he was he was nothing but gold to me so that's interesting we have both the, we have him in our in our hockey history yeah he's he's been he's been good to me too he's i mean he's i mean he had his job he had to deal with 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 the owner and stuff like that and uh, you know, it was not always easy. But I, in, in in all fairness, it was very good. It was very good to me. And you know what? He's he's pretty good at filing talents. I mean, he's he's got that eye, and he, he knows a lot of people. Knows a lot about the game, and uh, you know, and uh, he's. I think he's 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 made himself better as a person because in Vegas he went through things, personal things, and yeah. his own things. But he recognized that, and he he made himself better in all the power to him. So yeah, I, I owe him a great deal, hundred percent. What a but so that, let's celebrate that though. So you go from the English league where kind of like nobody's really wanting you, you know, yeah. like pro hockey. It's it's not really high up the ladder on the pro hockey list. Get signed by the AHL, which was a hell of a league back in the day. I mean, yeah. that was really for those of you who are listening who don't know. Like, so there was the AHL and the IHL, and the AHL was considered a little bit more of a developmental league. Like most of the farm teams were in the AHL it was younger, yeah. um, and the yeah. IHL was like older. Uh, generally skewed. A lot of guys would come back from the NHL and play there to kind yeah. of end of their career. Like it was good hockey. You know what I mean? That was really oh, yeah. good hockey. And, and you showed up there and you were top 10 in points and you're as, as a rookie, 98 points. You're, you're yeah, uh, 98 first points. Yeah. First, yeah. Butch Goring was our coach. Butch is uh, the first, I, I ended up Butch the first uh, four, ga- four games because I got set out. And then, uh, but after that, yeah, I had the chance and I uh, went back. Just another short break here to cut from the action and say thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your reviews. Thank you for your shares and your subscribes. Uh, Really, really am grateful. Uh, I'm grateful to make a difference. I'm grateful to help. And every time someone reaches out, whether it be through Messenger or Instagram or a comment on a YouTube channel or a review on on iTunes, uh, it's just a reminder to me that I am helping and that I'm making a difference and it brings a smile to my face and it is rewarding. So uh, thank you for taking the time to do that. It really does mean a lot and it really is inspiring to me and it keeps me moving forward. So once again, really appreciate that. And the other thing is it helps grow, uh, grow the platform. So it helps other people be able to get access to the information that is making such a big difference in a lot of uh, uh, players' lives. So thank you for that. And, and the players who have yet to hear this uh, because you haven't shared yet, uh, will thank you when you do. So much appreciated. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks for being a faithful listener. And we'll get back to the discussion with Patrice Lefebvre. Yeah, Butchie. Butch Goring was our, our coach there first year. So first go- four game, I got sat out. And uh, yeah, healthy scratch. I went to Strummer. I said, Strummer, I didn't come here to... You know, I was 26. And I didn't come here to sit in the stands. I got. I, he told me I was gonna play. I had. I had. I want my chance. And uh, he goes, ah, "Yeah, you're gonna. You're gonna play. You're gonna play." So I ended up playing the next game. A uh, couple assists, played, and uh, from there, never, never sat back again. But uh, after that, Butchie became, uh, you know, probably one. I one of my biggest fans as well. And we played with Radic Bomb, that 17 year old Czech kid, player on our line. And a guy named Ken Quinney that played with him for five years. Uh, he was my left winger all the time, but played with him in the year up to in, uh, in Frankfurt. But uh, yeah, our line was, was what? Well, so it was Radic Bonk, me, Ken Quinney, Todd Richards, 
that's coaching the NHL and a guy named Jean-Marc Bouchard. And we were playing the five guys all the time together. I was like plus 52. Uh, Quinny was plus 51. Richards and Richard were plus 50. Bonk was like plus 48. And we just had an unreal year that year. That was unbelievable. But uh, playing with uh, Jim Kite, uh, Clint Malarchuk, Lyndon Byers, Rod Boskis, uh, Steve Goddess, uh, Mark Vermet, uh, Brent Ashton. Uh, Brent Liberty. Ashton was there. I mean, anything like that, oh yeah, it was unreal. Unreal. It was, it was fun. We had a great year. We won the league. We should have won. We should have won the championship that year we, uh, we lost on the quarterfinal round uh, and uh, and listen to this so Jim Kite's our captain uh, that's a funny well funny yes and no but those days how it was in hockey so we don't have any bonuses for playoffs so we're all talking about that Jim Kite goes right before the game starts first game of the playoff Comes back and he goes, yeah, okay, now we have the play, we have bonuses, like right, right before starting the playoffs. I don't know if that that played against us, but I mean, we should have won. We should have won, anyways. But it was, yeah, it was it was unreal of a first year to make, you know, to have the fans involved and organization was good too. First years, first three years, they treated us like like professional, like NHL team, hundred percent. But so yeah, what, first uh, year was unreal. So what did Kite what, what did Kite do? So what he went and negotiated with the GM so they wanted to get yeah, the boys a bonus. And they were in the hallway and just negotiating and back and forth and back and forth. And finally goes, Okay guys, we're good. <laughs> we can't go. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was yeah, that was unreal. So uh, oh yeah. So yeah, the Radic Bonk, I'm glad you brought that up. So he uh so that was his draft year. I mean, he was the yeah. youngest player in the league by by far, right? I mean, yeah. it was an older league and <laughs> and yeah, 87 points in 76 games. Didn't he go like top 3 or something? Where did he go that year? It was Ottawa. He went to Ottawa. Yeah. yeah. But like yeah. high, right? Like what what yeah. pick did he go? First round, yeah, first. I'm not sure if he's the first pick or not. I don't remember. But it was I pick for sure. I okay. pick for sure. So you yeah. were you were his uh you were his line mate that whole year. Well, we uh, we let's say, you know, you know, we helped him. We helped him uh, get a good draft and get a good contract. That's for sure. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's pretty cool, yeah. man. Did you enjoy him as a as a person, Radic? Yeah, you know, well, he was a nice kid. He was a you know shy kid. Uh, the the funny thing is, he was my roommate. So we were rooming together on the road, and once he went to ottawa draft never heard from him again not once so i was like that's that's weird but whatever you know but yeah so he was a nice kid reserved kid he didn't, yeah. he didn't speak a lot of english he used to take english course uh, all the time in vegas and he got better as the season went but uh yeah it was uh it was it was a nice kid nice yeah, reserve. that's funny i mean he's six three two 20 and you're five four whatever 160 <laughs> Or five five, sorry, five five. That's right. <laughs> um, that that have been uh, that have been an awesome line to, to watch out there. That have been great. So yeah, but what, so, so and then so you so again you have to fight through some adversity there, right? Like a healthy scratch, and I mean whatever. Butchie's not not seeing whatever. Um, you know he could see, well, but then you, you, know, you, you. I understand it. Like I talked with him after. I mean, me and Butch were were friends, and he. I I mean, I was probably one of the best coach I had. Uh, not just for technical, but for the way he treat the people, the guys, uh, you know, was, was a player's coach. And, but he told me, he goes, I didn't, I didn't know you. So I, I, got, I went with the, the horses that I knew. I understand that, you know, and, and when I had the chance and I proved them and I never went out after, you know, but, I mean, I understand, I understand it's his first year. He wants to make, he wants to have success as well. I mean, I understand his point of view and he understood mine and, you know, but all, all at the end, they all came together and, and, and after that, uh, we had the guy Brad Lauer uh, that uh, was a uh, coach in the Edmonton Oil Kings in the Mural Cup this year, coaching the NHL a few times as assistant coach. And Brad ended up going to Ottawa that year as a free agent, and he was supposed to go to All Star team and All Star game. Sorry, and then Butchie was the All Star coach, and he's you know Butchie says, "Hey, I'm 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 bringing you instead of him, and uh, you know to replace him." So I mean, it's Butchie was really good to me after that too. So I mean. Yeah, it's funny how it started, but it ended up on a, on a high note, hundred yeah. percent. Oh, I mean, pretty essentially five hundred point seasons in a row, really. You know, I mean, ninety eight, ninety four, one hundred fourteen, ninety four, one hundred sixteen. 
Mm-hmm. Um, really solid numbers. Did you see that like you said the first three years there that you, you know, that they treated you professionally and the fans were behind you? Like, did, did you see the potential for what's happening now with the Golden Knights? Like, did you think that could be possible? Well, it was, I'll, I'll be lying if I'd say yes, because it's, it was the 90s, it was a bit different. Uh, I knew there was potential in the way that uh, the city kept growing and growing and growing and growing. I mean, I, if somebody would have told me, you think it's possible, like I said, it, it is possible. I wouldn't have said yes for sure, but yeah. possibility, but the way that the, the city has been growing, I mean, every year it was unbelievable. From the first year that I went, and I went in 2000, and I think in 18, because uh, the Thunder got uh, intronized in, uh, in the Hall of Fame in Vegas, the Southern Run Hall of Fame. And I didn't even recognize the place. I mean, it's, it's it's changed so much, so many, so much has been added. So, yeah. but I'm not I'm not surprised of the success, to be honest with you. Especially when they have, you know, when you have a, a winning product in Vegas, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a, a yes, yes for sure. Right. Yeah, pretty well. Yeah, I mean, so back to us. So when we, we when we go there, and you probably don't remember this either, I or even would have known about it because these websites and stuff didn't exist, but. When I yeah. left the AHL that year, I had 42 goals uh, when I got traded. And I was leading the AHL in goals. And so I'd never scored 50 as a pro before. So when I got to the eye, I needed eight, right, to uh, to get to get 50 yeah. in a season. And anyways, we got five together. Uh, you, uh, I think you probably assisted on every one of them. I got a hat trick, I remember, in uh, Houston, <laughs> I think, was one of the games. And uh, so I yeah. got five goals. And in eight games there, it ended up with 47 on, on the season. So, um, anyways, we were darn close. It would have been awesome if you would have, if you would have got uh, a couple more in the back of the net. And it was, uh, it was more on me, I remember, than you. I even remember, like, not kind of being a little bit snake bitten there a couple times. But uh, it was fun, man. Like, I liked, I really enjoyed playing with you. And I'm sure, I mean, that must have been – I mean, you played with a heck of a lot of great players. Uh, I won't even put, my, put myself in that category. But, I mean, a shooter with yeah. you – uh, which I was is you know yeah. Yeah, that's a match made in heaven, right? Like you love you love to pass, yeah. and you just wanted okay. a guy that could put in the back of the net. Yeah, and you know what? And I feel bad because when I when I played in in, in Long Beach with you, I was not half the players I, I, that I was, you know. So I felt bad. I even told Boxy at the end of the season. I said, "Hey, I'm I'm sorry. I just I was not myself." And you know, it's the truth. I, I wish I would have done more, better, but that was just that kind of a season. You know, I was my, I was, I, it's, and it's funny. Uh, one player I played against, Loney Loach. I don't know if you remember. Loney Loach, yeah. Loney Loach. Loachy, Loachy said something to me that year, and I was, I, I'll, I'll never forget. And he told me after a game, he goes, Pat, how come you don't play with the same passion as you used to? Oh, wow. You used to be unbelievable to watch. I was like, and, you know, so it just showed that I didn't have that same, you know, it was that year was different. So if if I knew it and that my opponent sees that and says that to me, I mean, it was, it was and it was true. So I, I feel bad because I, I wish I, I would have done more, more for you to get you that 52. I'm sure if I would have been the player I was the, the year before that, I would have got you 50, maybe 60 for sure. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. But, you know, unfortunately, you had me when uh, bad, uh, good, good, bad. How do you say that in English? Bad goods or good bads or something like that. You know, you get the good bads. Is that okay. something? Is that, is that something? No, I don't know. The good with the bad? The bad with the good? No, that, I, 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 I'm going to sound conceited here. I, I, was, I was a good player, but I was not in my in my good moments. I don't oh, know if you I say got, that. I got you. Yeah, so the, the, I got the bad oh. patty, not the good patty. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Hey, so with, with I wish that, I had the good patty. With that passion, though, like that word – Right. Because that is like there's another intangible that, that I've talked about before. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that is I believe it's a controllable. Right. Like it's something mm-hmm. that that, you know, when you love the game, I don't say you. I mean, like when I say you, I mean, players in general, mm-hmm. like yeah. when we when we love the game that comes out like there's a passion there. Right. That you're willing to do a little bit more. Right. There's a little mm-hmm. extra fire. There's a little you know, th- th- there's this a little extra in the tank. Right. That that makes the difference in these little and these battles, right. And the scoring, mm-hmm. the goal doing, of doing what it takes. Now, during the course of an 82 game season, or these kids that are playing junior now, 60, 72, mm-hmm. like there's times where that needs to be manufactured. I, yeah. I think, 
right? Like yeah, you have to be um, a cheerleader. Yeah, do you agree with that? I agree. Sometimes uh, we were more a cheerleader than anything else on the bench because there was was no life. There was no everybody was uh, amorph. I don't know if it's a word, but everybody, you know, and it's it's understandable, I think. But yeah, sometimes we were not coaching; we were doing cheerleading, you know. So yeah. less uh, correcting, more cheerleading, you know. Uh, the jump auto, keep going, you know. Great shift, you know. Uh, keep moving your day. You were great. Good skating there. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, yeah. So a hundred percent, I agree. 100% with you. hundred yeah. percent. And that's the thing, like, so as an athlete, and that's one of the things that I, when I'm talking with players now is, is like that personal, I call it your personal operating manual, you know, mm -hmm. like once you become a pro, like there's ways that Patty, there, there, there's things that you had to do before a game or during a game that made you be you, right. Like yeah. that, that brought yeah. out that best in you. And, and when I encourage the guys I work with, like to be really, really digging in on the self-awareness side about what those things are, you mm -hmm. know, because, you know, because it's not OK. It's tough to be consistent for 80 games or 72 games or of 60 course. games. Right. I mean, of it's course. hard. Right. And it's so if hard. you can minimize those down. Go ahead. No, it's true. I, like with traveling and everything like that nowadays, it's 100 percent. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so like finding, finding those little ways, like to bring that passion every night, right. To manufacture it, because that's one thing I, I say, like, it's, it's easy to go work out or go for a run or play a great game when you're motivated and feeling great. Right. I mean, that, that, that's easy. Like, but so what happens to the games where you don't, or the days where you yeah. wake up and you don't feel like doing it, or, you know, like those are the days that I think really separates guys because yeah, you know, the, the, the off nights, and I know when I brought this up talking about your career, right? I mean, there, 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 are, there, are, there are transition points where that just happens. I'm talking more now in general, like, like how yeah. to be, how to be a pro, right? Like yeah. how to be a pro. And you said that you had that there for like four or five years in, 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 a, in a row, right? Like what, what was it like when you were just rolling like that? Well, it's, I mean, it's, you just know, I mean, I mean, no kidding. I've always, I've all, I've loved the game. I, I I still love it to this day. I mean, I played till I was 42 years old. So I mean, I I I I love the game. I eat the game. And when I played and I was in my prime and I I couldn't wait for the next game for the next practice, you know? And I couldn't wait. I had I I I kid you not that the night before the game, I knew I was playing. I had a pregame skate in the morning. I had butterflies in my stomach. And I'm not kidding. I don't know what how to explain that. I knew I had my routine. I knew what I was doing, what I was going to eat, what, you know, and we're talking not 1990s and with was, there was no nutrition plans or stuff like that. So, you know, and, but I, I knew what was good for me and how I felt and my preparation was, and I'm telling you, I had butterflies going to bed. I couldn't wait. I was there, the first guy in the practice, first guy at ring all the time. I mean, I couldn't wait to be at the rink and, and, and play and just go out there and just, I, I couldn't wait for that, you know, so I, we, I, so yeah, there was some nights that was difficult, but that's when you have to, you have to dig deep and, you know, know why you're there, what you're going to do. It's going to be harder sometimes, but you're still there for a purpose. Yeah. The purpose doesn't change, you know, sometimes, yeah, it's, it's harder some days, but the goal is the same. The purpose is the same. That's what your, your mind has to be thinking about, you know. What was, um. One of the things when I'm talking to players now, uh, because everyone's so worried about points, you know, yeah. the vast majority of players, right? Like haven't figured out that there's other things that they can do to be, you know, to get noticed, to earn spots, to, you know, the, like the role, the, the, the roles that can be played and there are things you can be good at. So, you know, these guys that want scholarships, let's say, or these guys that want to get drafted, the players that I'm working with mostly are, you know, are, are amateur players. And they want the points, right? And and so their head gets so wrapped up in the points in the production that they forget what the hell they got to do to get the points in the first place, you know? Yeah. And, and I don't know how you thought about that because you were you were always a guy that produced. But like, like what the question I ask the guys that I'm working with a lot of times is like, when you're playing well, like mm -hmm. what are you doing? Right. Like, did you have the puck a lot? Were you first in the corner? Did you like, yeah. was there things that you focused on to, to allow you the opportunities to get the yeah. point? Well, for me, for me, my biggest thing was to have the puck. 
I needed to control the puck. Like you said, I'm a passer. So, you know, I was trying to attract a couple of guys on me and then get my teammates to get free and pass the puck. Even, even when you don't know your, the puck, you don't expect the puck to come in your stick, it's what's going to come. And, you know, for me, it was the compete level, moving my feet, having the puck on my stick, controlling the game, you know, deciding where the puck was going to go. That was, that was my element. You know? So <clears throat> that was my game. I had, I had the vision. I could find you wherever you were on the ice without a, without a problem. So I knew when I, knew when I that ga- in the warm-up, in the morning skate, when I was passing the puck on the stick, going hard or not, I knew what kind of game I was gonna have. That's that's, <coughs> excuse me. That's how I knew every, how things were gonna go. And for me to have a success was for me to control the puck. Right. That's, so, that's awesome. yeah, so you need the pies. One thing I say to the to to, to the guys, see, but then I break it down <laughs> one step further. And so, what did you have to do to get the puck? Like, what 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 were the things that you had to do well in order to have that puck in the first place? Well, first on puck, win the battles. Always, you know, you're talking about, I was a winger. I was a right winger. So corners, uh, picking pucks in your zone, you know, and, you know, I, I, I don't even know how many pucks I've lost, you know, when there, there was a rim coming on my side. I, I've, and 22 years pro plus all the years I've played, I don't even know if I, I know it's going to be, if I lost 20 pucks like that, you know, but that was, that's a skill that I worked on. And getting that puck because those days that straight pass first pass didn't really exist or rim the puck on the glass or whatever so i managed to get pucks and for me everything started from my own zone from there and then taking that puck in the neutral zone and going to that but yeah being first on puck and coming out with that puck out of the corners that was that was uh i had to do that yeah For those of you who want to work on your mindset to actually train a skill that will help you more than anything else you could dedicate time or money to, uh, which is a competitive advantage in this day and age, uh, which is personal development, right? What's between your ears? How can you make the most out of the skill set that you have? How can you show up with intention, uh, with purpose, with consistency uh, to be the leader amongst your group that you want to be to help give you the best chance to move forward? I have the program for you. It's called the Peak Potential Hockey Project. It's a four-week online program. It can be consumed on your own. It can be consumed with me called the Guided Mission where you get four coaching calls with me or it can be taken as a mentored mission where you work with me one-on-one. All of the details are on my website, upmyhockey.com, under services. Uh, Teams can also work with me directly. That's at all levels, whether it be junior, pro, uh, all the way down to amateur, minor hockey academies. I've worked with them all. All you need to have is keen players uh, that want to get better and that you want to create a culture of high performance. Uh, So, yeah, there's lots of ways to take the program. Lots of testimonials on there. It's making a massive difference for a lot of players, and I couldn't be prouder of what I've produced and how I'm helping athletes. So check it out, upmyhockey.com, for the latest uh, Up My Hockey uh, Peak Performance mission. Uh, The next guided mission starts on August 1st. Actually, that's a lie. If you're listening to this, it actually starts tomorrow. uh, If this is release day, uh, July 11th. So you can get in touch with me if you want to get a part of that program or if you want to get a part of the August 1st program, which is going to just dial you right in for an amazing season this upcoming 22-23 season, then get in the August 1st program. Uh, That can be, uh, once again, enroll on my website at upmyhockey.com. Cheers. Now back to the episode with Patrice Lefebvre. I mean, I love for, for, for the young players listening right now, or even the parents, like I, I love that you just even broke that down that like the offense for you started in your own end, right? Like that's just like, and that's again, like that's, not, that, that's the understanding of the game on a deeper level. And when, when players are curious about like how they get production, like that's one of the things, even these guys that I'm working with at the junior A level, right? Like they're, they're not connecting that dot, right? Like mm-hmm. how well I do in my own end and, and how we break out, with um you know with speed or with control allows me to get points you know i mean off the rush or whatever so um yeah anyways that that's awesome that you're saying that and i think that when players focus on that right like on that battle level the compete level on on uh, on understanding that when i get the puck like i need to slow this thing down because this is what i want right i'm not trying to get rid of it now like my whole shift has been around trying to get this puck now i got to do something with it right like when that's the focus it gets off of like 
you know, the scoring, the goals or doing, you know, like the, that type of thing, like the, the rest will take care of itself. I mean, you're, exactly. you are a good hockey player, right? And that's going to take care of itself on its own is you got to take care of the details prior to getting it. Right. I, you just said, it, you just said it so good. Once, once you have that puck on your stick, that's the easiest part. You know, it's what, what you have to do to get that puck, you know, it, it's reality. And when you have that puck on your stick, you know, it's maybe what, two, three seconds max you have usually, but. When you have that, what's what you're gonna be able to do with that? But the thing is, if you focus on just getting points, you're focusing on the wrong things. I mean, I've never, of course, I wanted points because I had no choice. I had to produce. I had to be something. I had to do more than the other guys, and you know, and that was part of my game. And it's fine, but I never focused. Oh, tonight I'm gonna have two goals or three goals, or you know, because if you focus that, it's not gonna happen. Because like you said, you're just putting your you're focused on something instead of not, and then you're forgetting the rest of it. Yeah. So I wanted to be, you know, I my biggest fo focus for me was move your feet, win your battles, get that puck, and then things are gonna happen. And once the puck was on my stick, that it was the easiest thing. Right. I knew what I knew what was gonna happen. I always knew it was gonna happen before I got the puck on my stick. But that's getting that puck, you know, like I said, getting those battles, getting that corner, making that quick move, whatever, quick give and goes and stuff to get that puck back. Little details that. That, that made it that I was able to get the points after that. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, I mean, that's great. I, I think it makes it simpler, too, for players, right? When you are when you have a couple key cues, right? Like move your feet. Yeah. I mean, for you, with the battles, like it, it, you're not thinking about the bazillion other things that you can be thinking about, you know, out no, there, no. you know? It it's just it makes it a little bit simpler. It allows, it allows you just to go and do what you do. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I was uh, – with the whole the, – the whole – being a playmaker thing. I, I want to ask you a question about that because I don't have yeah. asked that question before. Because I mean, I was the other side of it, right? I was the guy that was on uh, was on the end of the pass, and for me, I only really had myself to blame if I didn't beat the goalie or if I hit the post or whatever, yeah. right? Like, um, you have another level of accountability to the guy you're playing with because you can make a great play, and if that guy doesn't put it in the net, right? It's like shit. Yeah. Like you can kind of be a little bit of a finger pointer. Like, how was that? Because you, like I said, you can deliver the puck real well lots of times. And if somebody's not yeah. having their game, that means you're not having a good game production wise. How'd you deal with that? Well, you know, it's part of, it's part of it, you know, but uh, it's funny story. You say that because I was, I was brought in the organization. It's called the uh, Villemar Hurricanes. It's the same organization with Mario Lemieux. I uh, grew up. So I always followed Mario. Mario's always two years. So I always played after Mario uh, every time, every two years. So, I was fortunate enough to play with them one year because uh, they brought me up a category, but I was like 10 years old, I think maybe 9 or 10. But I was always followed Mario anyways. We always played ball hockey outside in the, in the school and stuff like that. But, and uh, and the coaches we had there were unbelievable. That organization for minor hockey in the 70s, uh, early 80s was unbelievable. We were, it was a family uh, that owned Burger Joint. It was called the Dilalos family. Uh, they paid for the sticks. They paid for our jackets. They, they had all our sticks colored in yellow with our name on it. I mean, it was unbelievable. They had us in the basement giving us hamburgers and stuff. And our coaches there uh, were uh, people that had a normal job, but they were so passionate. And the one thing they taught us was to pass the puck. So every time I hear the whistle from the bench and I didn't know what was coming, I had to drop the puck. No, not even looking. So I had to make a move, drop the puck, leave the puck, open that to the other guy. And that's how I learned to play. So I play, I learned how to play passing the puck and, and giving pucks to my, my teammates. And, you know, and fortunately we were walking back in passes, back in saucer, but, you know, at seven, eight, nine, ten years old, even earlier. So that's a part of game that I, I got better and better and I like doing that. So I always fought more, um, uh, complete when I made it. a great move, dig two guys, dig the goalie, gave you the puck, open net. I, I mean, that for me, that, for, well, for me, it was, you know, it was, it, that was, that's what was all about for me. So right. I was never uh, for the goal. I was always for the pass. So yeah, but that's because of growing up in that organization, learning to pass the puck like that and be unselfish. If I can say, use my teammates in another way that that's how I, 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 I got to be that, playmaker type of guy right so can you explain that a little bit more at the scrimmage you're saying you, you'd have the puck in a scrimmage and then your coach oh, no, uh, in the game 
in a game. In a game. In a game. We would go on a breakaway once against the goalie, and if we heard the whistle, we had to drop the puck. So I had to make a move, dig the goalie, and drop the puck. In the game. So you had to find some. You had to find somebody. Like you, you, you don't mean like you didn't have to make a drop pass every time. You just had to find somebody to pass to. Is that what you're saying? No, because if, if it was just say it's me and you going, so I'm I'm ahead of you with the puck. Yeah. So there's nobody coming back. So I'm I'm going to score, right? You're 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 maybe three four feet behind. Yeah. So obviously I'm going to go and score. So I make a move, and then the goal, the coach whistles. I have to drop the puck. The, the key was to drop the puck right in the middle of the, so the net. You have to drop the puck towards the middle. Not, not throw it hard. Just drop it so I knew that you're going to get there and get that open net. That's all it was all the time. Well, all the time. But yeah. so if I had four breakaways in a game, for sure once he was going to do it. <laughs> so you have to be aware. You have to be aware. So you, you, you could not think too much what am I going to do because you have to go with the puck with the goalie. I might have to be ready to dig the goalie, but I have to be ready to drop the puck too. You know, so it made it interesting. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. And the other thing that makes it interesting is it it also encourages guys to go to the net and follow up because they might be able to. They might be forced to get a pass, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, Some guys were not really happy when they got whistled because they wanted their goals, but yeah, that was right. fun. So Mario was Mario was my hero growing up, like. Frank, for sure, he was my guy. I mean, I liked other players, but he was he was my guy. Like <laughs> Pittsburgh Penguins logo on the locker. I mean, like I, I just loved everything about Mario. What was what was that like to to be around him? And yeah, I mean, he was older than you, so he must have been an idol for you too. I assume seeing him come up through the through the ranks. Well, it was it was you know, like I said, we were playing ball hockey outside and stuff. He was he was normal kid. Uh, he was probably six feet already when he was twelve, whatever. We knew we knew he had something. I mean, it was it was ridiculous what he could do with the puck, and even when he went bantam, then the first year, <coughs> excuse me, major Triple A dominated too. So, I mean, we knew he's going to be an all star. I mean, that was written in the sky. So, but just to watch him, <coughs> things he did with the puck. So, I, a few a few things I got from just watching him. I said, I have to try that. I have to try that. If I'm, finally, it worked. But <coughs> a few things that he. For him to came natural, and also is for us guys, we have to work on things a little more. But yeah, it was it was a treat just to 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 watch him because we played before. So we pee wee just say pee wee double A played before, then Bantam double A, then Midget double A, and played after that. So we all played, and we all set. Nobody left. We all want to see Mario play. I mean, already at 13, 14 years old. So yeah, <clears throat> that was un that was unreal. That's cool. That is really awesome. It is. Um, so, yeah, well, we're already over time. I told you, I mean, not, not that we All have right. a time limit, but um, no I, I want to talk just maybe we'll take the last couple of minutes here just to talk about what you're doing now, uh, meaning yeah. the, the coaching side of it. Did you, you know, you said earlier you've always been super passionate about the game and the game has been a part of you essentially your whole life. Did you know after playing it for 42 that that was what you wanted to do? Definitely get into the coaching side of it? Absolutely. I did. And, uh, you know, it hurt me a little bit because I played till 42 and coaching wise, they started late a little bit. And then, uh, I stayed in Europe. So with, uh, family reasons and health reasons. So, uh, kind of hurt us a little bit, hurt me a little bit with my, uh, you know, my, my coaching career being back in North America, but finally last year I was able to go back in the, in the Quebec league as assistant coach, but I I'm looking forward to harder possibilities i i think i'm i'm there you know so so to speak again i don't want to sound pretentious but with all the experience i have in in the game and where i'm from where where i come from and everything like that i i think i'm i'm ready for the next step and i'm just waiting for those that opportunity what what, what do you find what do you find most rewarding uh, about about being a coach well one thing uh it's it's i just got this year uh our captain uh he won the memorial cup uh, a few years back, and uh, uh, he, he's just played as a 20 year old, and he just wrote me a, a reference letter. And he said, Pat, I want to I wanna write this letter for you because you've, uh, you've, changed, you've changed the player I am. And I was like, okay. And things like that, when you have players coming and telling them, telling you how you've helped, and you know, the things he said on that letter, I was like, I, it's the first time I've 
I said, I told my wife, I said, this is unbelievable. So recognition of a, a player, not the, because of the points or whatever he does, but knowing that I made him, I did something for him, not just on the hockey side, but the personal side as well. That's, that's rewarding. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it's all about at the end. You know, it's the connections and what you, if you can change somebody's not life, but you know, perspective and something like that. And, and, and for me, it's, uh, I've, the one comment I've had from the players who I've been coaching 13 years now, it's that the players, you know, they, they, I, I always go with merits. For me, there's never a name. There's never a number. It's with merits. And I've always thought I wanted to be coached in a fair way that if I deserved it, then I earned it. If I didn't that day, I didn't, you know, and it's okay. And I've always coached that way. And I think I've had a lot of respects from the players for that because I'm a fair coach. That's the big, that's the biggest word that from the 13 years I've been coaching that I'm a fair coach. And the guys know that, that if you're going to give me hundred percent and you know, you deserve to play, you're going to play. And sometimes a guy beside you has it more than you do. And you have to respect that. So that's, that's the biggest thing, biggest compliment I had from the players that I'm an honest coach and, you know, I, I go with merit. So yeah. There's, there's no there's there's no uh, favorites either. Yeah, that's uh. You I mean you talk about the reference letters, and you mean I'm I'm blessed <laughs> with the fact of what I do that I I you know I I receive those types of things now and again as well, and it really reminds me of what you know that it is important what you do, you know what yeah. what, what we do, and uh, because you do make an impact. You mean and and again, yeah. it, to me, I don't pretend to be these players are the ones that put in the work and they're the ones that are, are maybe going to listen and apply it or do the thing. So I mean, it, it's on them. Like I don't, I don't, I try and take as little credit as possible, but the fact that we can be on a platform or, or help or help the process, right. It, it, it yeah. is, it is life changing, right. I mean, it is like, there are things that you can, whether it's the career, whether it's life or whatever, like mm -hmm. you really can have an impact. And I think, um, I mean, and I hear it in your voice too. It's like when you put the athlete first, period mm -hmm. right like put the athlete first put their experience first what they want first um like that shines through like loud and clear and, and i know i remember when i had coaches like that you know what i mean like where it was like okay this isn't about him or it's not about his career it's not about you know this it's about it's about what's what's going to tick for me right like that's a really mm -hmm. cool spot to find and and um and yeah, the hockey's become much more relationship based i, I find yeah. right like from a coaching yeah. standpoint um, you have to build trust with the players. You can't just tell them what to do. They want to know why they're doing it and, you know, and, and all the rest yeah. of it. And, um, and I think that's a good thing. I really do, because yeah. I, I think that uh, there's a there's a human element involved in, in sports for sure. Right. Especially when you're dealing with a team sport like hockey, where we have 20 players that need to, you know, trust each other, go to bat for each other, get along with each other. Um, and they all have different goals and they all have different yeah. dreams. Right. And and it takes somebody like you behind the bench that that needs to manage that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when that gets managed well, good things happen, you know for sure. Yeah. Um, you just said it. it's, we're all humans. We're all people. We're different. You know, we we have different things going on in our lives, and everything's you know. But we all we all go for the same goals. We we strive for the same thing. It's a grind. I mean, it's a process, like you said. Mm -hmm. And and if if the guy that plays for you can't trust you, it's I mean it's for, for everything. The guys that you are working with. You know, for the mental aspect, he doesn't trust you. Whatever you say, it's it's not gonna go in. Yeah. So I mean, you you need you need that you need that trust aspect, and then it's not always gonna be perfect. It's not gonna always go uh, in and say, oh yeah, the coach is always right. It's always gonna be guys are in, guys are out. It's it's normal. On twenty two guys, it's you can't have twenty two guys all the ways thinking the same thing, and it shouldn't it shouldn't be right. But as long as you have that respect factor then you know always starts from there 100 percent. yeah so you talk about meritocracy um and coaching from a meritocracy standpoint which do, do you think that comes from your own personal experience like being somebody that maybe didn't get the chance like are you looking for those kind of diamonds in the rough like are you, you want somebody to like you know what i mean you know what i'm saying by that right yeah. like like being able to coach that way i think really allows a culture of mm -hmm production right because there like you what you what you do is going to get rewarded and i i think i think that's a really helpful place to come from but do you think that has something to do with your own experience with the game probably probably the unfairness that i was i was i went through probably 
you know, I'm I, I I'm not a political guy. I've always believed in, you know, if even if I, I didn't deserve to play that day, I was I was bad or I didn't I didn't have it, then I deserve to, you know, have less ice ice time and it's fine. But sometimes you have to go with with the odds, you know, sometimes in the decision. Even though I had a bad game, my coach probably put me in on the six on five when there was a, a minute left in the goal because you have to go with the odds. But in all fairness for me, yeah, I probably it does come from that. So yeah. and, and and you get you get so much more from the guys when you do that because they compete between each other from the right for the right reasons. And you know, and everybody knows that hey, if you have not a bad game, if you have it less that day. And uh, Poto has it more, then Poto's gonna, he's gonna go. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. the next day, maybe Poto's not gonna have it less, and, and Tommy's gonna be, you know. Yeah. So I think, like you said, it brings a, a level of competi competition, competitiveness between them, and it's 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 they all know what what to expect. There's no gray area. It's yeah. black and it's white, and you guys do that, and it's it's gonna it's go. So, you know. So for me, it's easiest way to, to do that is that way. So. Cool. So as far as you now going forward, what is, uh, I know you've always been a, a goal driven guy, um, you know, and, and, and trying to, you know, have, have goals and dreams and set. So what does that look like for you in your coaching, uh, in your coaching world is, is, uh, being one of the 32 head coaches of an NHL team. Is, is that, is that, uh, is that the let's, pinnacle for you at this well, day? Let's be honest, uh, head coach, no, but I'm in talks with a few NHL teams, uh, Made well with uh, player development, or you know, uh, video coach, even assistant coach uh, on the bench in the first team, or in the American Hockey League level, and you know, working with the guys. I'm uh, I'm in talks with a few teams, and uh, my name is there, and just waiting to, to hear back about the draft and everything like that. So it's uh, timing is not there, but uh, hopefully, I will hear back from uh, from a few of them and, uh, and see what happens. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, so the next step would be oh, hopefully a step to the NHL, but then, you know, who knows, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of life left, right? Uh, one of my good buddies, Brad Larson, there just got the head coaching job in uh, in Columbus. I mean, Columbus, he was assistant yeah. for, for seven years, right? You know, he kind of, you know, that that was that was his, his dream. He didn't really have a timeline or whatever, but now he's got yeah. it and he's running with it. So, yeah, I guess you never know what happens. But um, being, being around the best players in the world, uh, in the best league in the world, would probably be a pretty cool uh, experience. Well, it's just just getting my foot in the door, you know. I've I've always I told one uh, one GM I won't say his name, but he's he's a GM from the NHL team, and he's, he's I can say we are friends. I even told him, hey, if I need to go swipe the floors of the bathroom of the guys, I will do it. Just get my foot in the door. I mean, I'm willing to do everything. I'm hungry. I'm I know what I can bring, and you know, I'm not like I said, I'm not looking for a million dollar. I just want the opportunity, just like I did when I was a player, right. to prove what I'm done, and then you guys decide if I'm worth it. But I just need that one opportunity to get my foot in the door, and then, and then it's it's on me, you know. So that's all I need. That's fantastic. That's a great way to end. Um, thanks for joining us. I know you're all the way over there in Italy, and we had a little bit of connection issues, but I think it, I think yeah. it worked out well enough uh, from a from an audio standpoint. Really love hearing your story and have an opportunity to share it. And um, yeah, I mean, an inspiration, really, man. Like you're a professional yeah, you. uh, from when I from when I knew you. Uh, you know, your your career says says a ton you know i mean you just look at the stat line to to do what you did in, in the area you played at the size you were there had to be a lot going right between the years um not just from a skill standpoint but you had a yeah. lot of other things to overcome so thanks for sharing all that with us today and uh, i hope i hope all the all the coaching dreams uh, come true for you partner Paulo, thanks a lot thanks for having me appreciate it. keep doing the good work with the guys there and uh, you're doing a good job and it was it was a pleasure reconnecting again man cheers all right buddy take care Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of my conversation with Patrice Lefebvre. Pa uh, Patty, thanks so much for, uh, for coming out today. I really, really enjoyed my time uh, catching up with you again. And uh, I, I love that you call me Poto, actually, for those listening. Uh, usually it's Pods or Podsy uh, throughout, my, uh, throughout my career. And, and Patrice was one of the only players, if not the only one, that called me Poto and still to this day calls me Poto, which I, which I like. So that's cool. Uh, awesome thing about hockey that you got to get a nickname early <laughs> or, uh, or you're not liked. Uh, the, the fact that, that if somebody calls you by your first name, um, you have not been accepted by the group yet, at least back when I, back when I was playing. So hockey nicknames was always a, was always a fun thing. But um, just a recap of the discussion with Patrice, uh, you know, five foot five. 
to do the things that he did, to, to have the production that he did, uh, to, to continue to show up as consistently, you know that people are looking for a reason to say no, right? That's the thing. When you're five foot five, the world's different in, in hockey. Uh, well, even now, but especially in that day and age, that if you didn't show up, you were gone. People did not want to look for opportunities for you. They wanted to look for reasons to say no. So we had to overcome this again and again and again and to supply production consistently and to show up with an edge to his game that other people just simply didn't have to do. Uh, so like what, what an inspiration, uh, to have the career that he did, to score the amount of points that he had, to win the awards that he did, uh, to go through the ups and downs of the leagues that he played on, to be an IHL scoring championship, and then to earn his three games in the NHL really is a fantastic thing. I wish nothing but the best for Patrice. He's now in the coaching, uh, market. The fact that he, he talks about meritocracy in my introduction, I talked about meritocracy and how the LA Kings did not want to award merit, uh, how they financially punished me for being productive. Uh, I mean, that is not how uh, Patrice operates as a coach. He wants those guys who are going, that are working, to get rewarded. And you know what? We as humans, we appreciate that. That's what we want. We want a fair chance. We want a fair shake. And we want things uh, to be, you know, relevant, to, to have it make sense. Uh, so, so for him to do what he's doing now, uh, for him to have the pedigree that he has and the resume that he has, I know whatever bench he's on, he's going to be able to impart a lot of knowledge. Uh, he's going to give the players an honest shake, and uh, and he's a great communicator. So it'll be awesome for uh, to watch his career. And uh, Patty, I lift, wish nothing but the best for you, and hope you land that NHL job soon. And if not, wherever you land, I wish you nothing but success. So once again, uh, lots of good stories here. Uh, but till next time, play hard and keep your head up. Just one.